All right, so let's start with section 50. And I'll try to get through, I'll try to read quickly, but not, um, but not too quickly. If you can't hear me, or if I'm going too quickly, please just type something in the chat to me or to everyone so that I can adjust for you. Um, so section 50, which begins in our translation on page 112, phenomenology in the tradition of Husserl thus has a problem. The problem of how to show the intertwining and yet the hierarchy of consciousness and reality. This is a step fraught with problems. Um, one of the early ways in which Husserl tries to discuss the intertwining and hierarchy is by way of the word constitution. At the bottom of page 113, we see how he puts the word in inverted commas. Quote, we have not lost anything, but rather have gained the whole of absolute being, which rightly understood contains within itself, constitutes, their constituirate is in quotes, within itself, all worldly transcendencies. Constitution is not creation. I prefer to understand it as recognition, as a response to givenness. It is to extend givenness within a relational field by gearing our acts into the concatenation of indeterminate aspects yet to be seen more clearly. If pure consciousness is now the field of phenomenology, this does not mean we are not looking anymore at objects. Rather, it is the how of the manner of appearance or the manner of givenness that we follow within the acts of consciousness that take them up. So I'm going to go to 51 now. Two interesting notes come up in section 51. Towards the end, before the note on page 116, Husserl notes that consciousness is essentially pure and absolute. Its having an embodiment, therefore, is not essential to what consciousness is. This may be a significant challenge to my own view that I've been trying to develop with you across the last two weeks. So I will take some time to acknowledge what he says here. He says, quote, the existence of a nature cannot be the condition for the existence of consciousness, since nature itself turns out to be a correlate of consciousness. Nature, that is the sum of all objects that behave in a particular way, right, is only as being constituted in regular concatenations of consciousness. But I might ask, so that's the end of the quote, what is a lived body as my own? What is the relation of Leib, the German word for lived body, to consciousness, if not a relation internally between consciousness and nature as such? Could there be a consciousness that was not internally related to the world by means of what it consciousness was as embodied? So, Bill, you were talking a little bit before about, you know, what is our relation to world? Could we give up a relation to world and be consciousness? No. So are we not then linked from within to whatever nature is that he says is not necessary for consciousness? Perhaps if we were to leap ahead in terminology and thought a bit, though still clinging to the spirit of what is said here on page 116, there is a kind of answer that does not dwell in the realm of a particular part of the world, as my lib certainly positions itself to be. Perhaps instead of nature or an organism within nature, we can say that consciousness as such has a flesh insofar as the life world, the Lebenswelt, is intimately tied to consciousness as such. Perhaps it is this intimate intertwining of world and consciousness for however long it lasts, barring any sudden refractory events, that allows consciousness to have a particular body in this particular instantiation, mine, of pure consciousness. In any case, that's I actually put forward that in light of the crisis, but that's well later than this passage. In any case, in the note on page 116 to 117, Husserl then goes on to talk about God. If we as consciousness are absolute and yet are separated into, into separate streams that have harmonious experiences of the same world and the same things, then we would have to look to a God, if we did, as, quote, in the absolute itself. The principle that organized the teleology that binds all of us as instantiations of the absolute ego would not be outside us, would not have a transcendency like that of the world. It would be more like Meister Eckhart, who was a Dominican uh, mystic, 
Meister Eckhart's discussion of imminence and the sun coming to be born within the soul, a soul that only God can touch. But all of this does not mean that we are God. Rather, this means that there are a number of meanings of transcendence or that transcendence would have. Quote, this is on page 117, there must be therefore within the absolute stream of consciousness and its infinities, modes, plural, in which transcendencies, plural, are made known other than the constituting of physical realities as unities of harmonious appearances. God's transcendence then might well be imminent without being an object of experience as a thing. The otherness of God, in other words, might be within us without being a simple function of our own possibility. Rather, God might be both a function of our possibility and impossibility simultaneously, like the tracing of our own absence at the heart of presence, instead of the tracing of indeterminacy through determinacy. In any case, these two points are important for us now, live body, transcendency of God, only insofar as it requires us to do some thinking about how transcendence was earlier described by Husserl as essentially related to the way we perceive things, and how we could ever come to be a consciousness that was simultaneously pure and worldly, which we do experience ourselves to be. These questions will get some further answers as we continue, but suffice it now to say that I think two things. One, the reduction of the Leibhaftigkeit, fleshiness of things, to the Leibhaftigkeit of consciousness is not a done deal without the embedding of Leib as such in consciousness. And two, only the God who could wrestle with Jacob, for example, could be God of an embodied and yet pure ego. It is not that God is not within the world, but rather that constitution of God is not a simple one-way process in which I follow out pre-delineated aspects. Rather, God would be a God of surprise, silence, and co-constitution, co-constitution, that was essentially different in kind from the constitution in which I merely follow, adapt, and engage my future within a world already given as itself within my very self-givenness, the world given within my self So I'm going to go to 53. To support my view of consciousness as inherently shot through with the structure of live or lived body, even in its purity, I would like to look briefly at 125, page 125 of section 53. Here Husserl says that Consciousness as embodied is an, quote, annexation, an Knüpfung, and that in being embodied, it, quote, loses none of its own essence and can take up into itself nothing alien, the word is fremda, which will be important for later, nothing alien to its essence. So as I read this, this is in the middle of the page, right near 104 in the margin. Uh, in the very least, a lived body is not alien to the essence of consciousness. It cannot be if the whole world is an intentional meaning that makes sense to consciousness. And yet, as Husserl says, this is still on uh, 125 at the bottom paragraph break, still it has become something other, Anderen. Lived consciousness as embodied is a, quote, this is at the top of 126, a transcendence of a peculiar kind. Transcendence, then, as rooted in experience of perfect perception of things, broadens out to include things that are lived imminently as mine, my body, my God, my other person, the other fremda. Whatever that transcendence is, body, God, other, it is a transforming kind of action to consciousness, and yet not simply alien, not that which all by itself either joins or separates consciousness from world. I'm going to 55 now. Husserl ends this chapter three by talking about how consciousness, and this is to Bill's point, bestows sense on correlates. To have a thing, a unity of meaning, this is to Sally's point, I think, is to have to recognize that consciousness has done something. It has acted, it has bestowed. The givenness of the thing is what consciousness immediately affirms and makes determinate. 
Reality and world, Husserl says on page 29 at the top, are, quote, unities of sense, this is at the end of the broken paragraph, related to certain concatenations of absolute, of pure consciousness, which by virtue of their essence, bestow sense and demonstrate sense validity precisely thus and not otherwise. That's the end of the quote. So to bestow sense is to be engaged for Husserl in the project of Zingebung, giving sense. M you might say making sense in that you would say that makes sense to me. That use, I realize, blurs the line between passivity and activity, but nevertheless, that's what I think is happening. The notion of sense giving or sense bestowal is thus an attempt to get clear on what constitution could mean from the earlier section. Again, it, I, do not, I do not believe it is creation. In, in fact, um, Monsignor Sokolowski wrote a book where he talked about constitution early on, I think in the 80s. And he makes the same point. It is instead an attempt to understand how consciousness is, and this is on 129, the three lines from the bottom, the field where sense is bestowed. So if you think of consciousness less as mine right here, zooming out, doing something, and you more see it as a field that almost gets us to where we need to go, I think. Um, it is it, consciousness, is a process of recognition and response to the upsurge of the event of consciousness of. It is not a two-step process where there is first a presence and then a word. It is the recognition as a moment of the two-sided upsurge. As Meister Eckhart says of the birth of the sun in the soul, the moment of birth and the moment of readiness are the same moment. To be perceived is to be recognized as, to be conscious of, and this as and of are the intertwining of consciousness and object that call for the act of consciousness without the sense being reducible to that act alone. Uh, keep going. I, I know it might be a surprise that I'm talking about Meister Eckhart. I'm just, you know, trying to gear into the phenomenology religious experience a little more this week and maybe next week. But I was doing pure Husserl before. Now I'm trying to, to get us to think about these. So in section 56, Husserl speaks about phenomenology as a science of origins in quotes. It is not the origin in being that is so important as much as the origin of sense. How does the meaning of an experience arise? What are its structures? The natural sciences, and indeed any practice or system that rests on the natural attitude, is excluded in the phenomenological reduction. It is a bracketing of the very assumption that consciousness and world are separated. And that's why nature doesn't work for him, because nature was this sense of a whole interconnected region of things and processes that lay outside of consciousness. It's not that we can't recognize those things and processes into interconnection. We're just not declaring them to be a self-subsisting system outside of consciousness. Again, it's a very bracketing of the assumption that consciousness and world are separated. We cannot say anything about the separable being of things. 57, when talking about the pure ego, I think I'm coming to terms with the, the things that everyone probably here in this room has already come to terms with. But for me, it, I find it hard. The pure ego is not something we, quote, encounter anywhere in the flux of lived experience. Uh, this is 32, 132. It appears, but continuously and all at once. It seems to be there continually, he says. This is a quote on 132. It does not appear within lived experience as a component. It belongs to each lived experience, and each cogito belongs to it. And it lives through each cogito, each act that intends an object. The pure ego is thus the motor of each lived experience, the internal link between each lived experience to all the others. The manner in which each lived experience is given within a total flux, and as such, can be linked to all other particular consciousnesses. The ego is not simply a form, or if it is a form, it is the form of belonging as such, 
that ties reflection to lived experience from within. Quote, and this is one bottom of 132 over to 133. In every actional cogito, the ego lives out its life in a special sense. But all mental processes, lived experiences, all lived experiences in the background belong to it, and it belongs to them. Belonging, I'm going to focus on that word, because I think that this gets at something really important about the ego. And by the way, I think that's the motor of freedom, is the way that the ego does not appear directly, and yet is the very appearance of the belongingness of all experiences to one another. Belonging leads to a perception of what is not an object. Belonging leads to the grasp of the ego that is the very connectedness of experiences, the having of them, the binding of them together. Belonging is the form of consciousness as such. The pure ego is thus the way in which we belong to our past lived experiences and the way in which we can make transitions or conversions of this lived experience into that next one or into the change of a lived experience into an object of reflection. The pure ego after the reduction is another unique kind of transcendency. So he's going through, he's making a catalog of transcendencies that we grasp by means of consciousness and they're different in kind from one another. So this is page 133 in the middle. There is presented in the case of that ego, a transcendency of a peculiar kind one which is not constituted, a transcendency within imminency, an appearing that is not constituted. It is not given in such a way that I have an active role in uncovering its sense. Rather, it is given as the very impossibility of getting a distance from it sufficient to do that. And thus, as making sense, the ego makes sense, without having sense. Now, the thing within a lived experience is also a transcendence within imminence. All things are transcendence within imminence insofar as we're within phenomenology. But this being within of the thing, as opposed to the I, is not radical. Its transcendence is its opening itself onto the future of my concatenated acts of knowing or perceiving. And as such, the thing is essentially akin to those acts, the thing, as their very future. The thing is my future. The being within of the pure ego is, however, radical insofar as I can gain no distance from it, and insofar as my acts do not make it more clear. It is the present and past and future of myself. It is a doubling that is not a doubling, an appearing that is not quite an appearing. Thus, we have transcendencies of multiple kinds. The thing, the other person, God, the pure ego. Each one makes different demands. In the case of the pure ego, it is not constituted. We do not participate in its meaning as something we respond to. Rather, it has always already given itself as what we are immediately and totally. There is no process of call and response. There is one simply of belonging, and only of belonging, I think. You may, of course, disagree with me. Um, and I'm going to go through section 60 and break to, to hear what you have to say. Um, so there's three more sections, 58, 59, and 60. So in 58, God now enters into experience by way of the wake and questions left by the appearing non-appearance of the pure ego. This is on page 134. Quote, I think it's in the middle of the page, underneath 111 in the margin. The transition to pure consciousness by the method of transcendental reduction leads necessarily to the question about the ground, just like origin, now the word ground is important, the ground for the now emerging factualness of the corresponding constitutive consciousness. The discovery of the pure ego as the principle of belonging of all our concrete lived experiences thus places us within an urgent existential question. How is it that this pure ego is each of us? How did we emerge as each tied to this pure ego and yet different from it? How is the unconstituted ego precisely the motor for the project of constitutive consciousness? How can what is outside the process of recognition motivate the process of recognition 
as the call and response of meaning. Whatever God would be, God would be such a ground for the origin of my life as constitutive, as embedded within the world and the world within me. But this God would quote, and this is 134 on the bottom, would transcend not merely the world, but absolute consciousness. And this would mean that God would be a unique way of being absolute, would be transcendent, and this is 134, five lines from the bottom, quote, in a sense totally different from that in which the world is something transcendent. God would be my ground insofar as belonging has generated an appearing non-appearance of the pure ego. By means of the ego, there is a kind of belonging of the divine within me and I within the divine, if you refer the divine to ground, that does not appear and that is not simply another functional level of my consciousness. The intimacy and the remove between I and God would be greater than between I and world or I and thing. God would be a ground and a telos and as such would be fully present and fully absent at the same time or neither present nor absent. Phenomenology thus can describe transcendency as a meaning in a number of different ways, depending on how we talk about community or belonging. Section 59. This section is an interesting argument about how formal ontology and mathesis universalis is excluded. Phenomenology is concerned with the meaning of transcendence as such, and thus it must exclude any science or concept that assumes that transcendence is already accomplished as a separation of consciousness from reality. Rather, any insight into transcendence, any description of any sort of object, must come from, the relate, from within the relationship of consciousness to that object. Husserl says this in the middle of page 136. Quote, where the fashion, this is like towards the end of the middle paragraph, where the fashioning of concepts and judgments is not a process of constructing them, where no systems or immediate deductions are built, the doctrine of forms of all deductive systems, as found in mathematics, cannot function as an instrument in material research. Phenomenology allows its concepts and judgments to be given within the call and response of subject and object, that is, within the overarching complex of experience that we call consciousness. That is to say, the thing participates in conceptualization by telling us how to approach it. The transcendency under discussion, whether that of the thing, the lived body, the pure ego, God, the other person, etc., will have to announce its own peculiarity. This is how we're getting to what Bill asked about and, and Gordon about eidetics. Phenomenology thus is, quote, a purely descriptive discipline. This is the last paragraph on 136 at the beginning that uses pure intuition to arrive at pure concepts that could describe pure consciousness. This means that pure consciousness, the pure ego, the very eidetic structures of experience are themselves experiences. Categories are not deduced or constructed as they were in Kant. And so, Bill, what I wanted to say all along is, whatever the essences are, they're going to show you what they are. Um, and they only when they show you what they are, will you see what they are. <laughs> um, so the norm we follow then is the principle of all principles. We make evident only that which we receive, and this is still on page 136, quote, by observing consciousness itself in its pure eminence. We make evident, and thus we have an active role. But what we make evident is what we experience by way of reflection on the very process in which we are engaged. I'm going to do section 60 very briefly, and then we can break for a discussion. In section 60, Husserl clarifies how the phenomenologist following the transcendental reduction is capable of an eidetic science. The I day we work with are those of consciousness as the complex that includes the sense of the transcendent within it. Thus, to the extent that consciousness is of objects or of lived experiences or of God, we can describe these transcendencies only in the way they appear within that relation. So at 138 at the top, he says, we can in no way posit the being of such essences. Even the essences such as thing in itself or object as such, perhaps Olga fact, but I'm not sure yet about that. 
These are not the subject of ontological descriptions. Rather, these ontologies are bracketed in favor of wrestling with the meaning of their belonging within consciousness as such. We focus not on being, but belonging, not on separation, but on intertwining. We do not achieve phenomenology by way of reflecting on the essences of objects independent of consciousness, but on the essence of the intertwining itself on the correlation of the noesis and noema, which hopefully we will do in the, in the next meeting. So um, take five or 10 minutes to uh, raise any issues or thoughts or comments you might have. I wonder if I could just ask a very quick question all throughout this and both in the text as you read it and then as you expanded on it, <clears throat> the, the name that came to mind repeatedly was Merleau-Ponty. And it just seemed to me that what, whatever there was to get in what you've just got was what he got so profoundly. I don't even know if I know what I'm talking about, but that's the way it seemed. I often find it difficult to feel any distance between Merleau-Ponty when I read Husserl. I think what I what I see as Husserlian is this very notion of imminence and ground and the intertwining that does not lead um away from a certain kind of scientific teleological um, principle. With Merleau-Ponty, I find it harder to find that teleological principle. I'll just say that. So as long as we're bringing in other people, um, I keep on, every t when I'm listening to Husserl now, um, I keep hearing Sartre, and um, I don't see many people make drawing that connection because he he seems to be wanting to draw the connection more with Heidegger. But this notion of consciousness that Sartre discusses, and I'm by no means an expert in this. Um, I mean, I keep I, I I'm listening to you talking about this transcendental ego. I mean, I feel like I'm I'm some sort of Cartesian something or other and that it exists somewhere in the ether or something. And I know you were trying to resist that, but it, it um, in fact, I keep wondering whether this transcendental ego is even mine, um, whether it belongs to all of us or none of us. Um, <laughs> I think it's, and I, this, hopefully we'll get to some more of the sections. I think it's prior to the distinction between one and many. And that doesn't feel good because we are already past that distinction. And so that's why I think it feels like it's in the ether, just as I think it's hard to come up with bracketing because we're already beyond the distinction between acts of consciousness and objects. To have an experience is to presuppose that distinction, but the origin of that experience and the way in which phenomenology positions itself is, in, is back into the indistinction between the the poles, uh, you know, it's it's aiming there. It's never able to get there. So my own view is that um, what phenomenology has difficulty doing with Husserl is communicating the the way in which the pure ego, the transcendental ego, the transcendental reduction, all of those things are a way to attend in specific ways to the prior characterization of experience as the, the source of distinctions. Anyway, that's why I focus on belonging. And that very idea of getting to that point, it seems to me, is that how can we talk about the principle of all principles, that which presents itself as it is, as a fundamental source, if we keep, get, like you're saying, we keep somehow moving toward things like that which is prior to distinctions, which it doesn't seem like we 
have that kind of intuition of. And, and again, I neither one of us are saying this this to dismiss that or to say, well, this isn't that something isn't going on here. But I think that's I agree that that's that's kind of the issue that and it's a totally the fundamental basic issue in phenomenology, I think. Um, I wanted to add, um, I was trying to find the place in the text, but cannot locate, locate it offhand. Husserl talks about um, uh, the consciousness, that consciousness uh, analyzed by phenomenology is uh, individual consciousness. And I think what or individual or individualized, um, which uh, I think he means that consciousness, which we analyze already, incorporate the notion of individualization of things. Uh, um, so if reduction gives us essences, pure essences, the field of essences. Essences are already, uh, you know, one essence is separate from the other, so it's already related to individual things. Um, so um, I think that the uh, one and many is already embedded uh, in the very notion of reduction, and that's, that's by choice. Uh, it's not necessarily that uh, any reduction will uh, make us landing uh, within the realms of individualized consciousness. That's the freedom or part of the freedom. I just wanted to mention that. Doesn't um, the transcendental ego <clears throat> have to be before consciousness? Because it has to give us consciousness. Because um, every conscious thing is already this constituted something or other. And if the pure consciousness, I, know, I just, it has to be somehow or other behind consciousness. As if, if we have consciousness, there has to be something giving us consciousness. And that's what the transcendental ego is somehow accomplishing. I think that's true. And yet the problem is, Husserl says, the transcendental ego, that I am. So how, and, and, and yet, then the issue precisely is, he says that I am it. And yet, when you look at how he's describing it, it's clearly something universal that seems to be really that which all egos have in common or the source. And that's, I, I really think this is an issue that's unresolved in his text. Sally. Well, this is why I like Michel Henry so much, because in a weird kind of a way, he doesn't have to explain where this comes from, because what he, he argues is that it just springs forth from us because we're alive. And he, he even says things like, this is the gift from God, this springing forth business. We can't explain where it comes from, specifically because he says in order for something to happen, something must happen to make that happen. And so, I mean, I just, on, on the one hand, it I know I've seen criticisms of Henri that this is just kind of like a cop-out, but he's saying, you know, this is the mystery of life. Where does this come from, this, this springing forth? So, I think that Husserl is trying to get is saying what he where he thinks it comes from, but I mean Michel Henri even is is before that where that I hope I'm making sense. Well, I think there's no question that Henri, when he talks about uh, life and how he the language is very clear that my life is life somehow, and then in in. Uh, um, in I Am the Truth, he actually wrote a book called I Am the Truth, if you can believe that. But um, uh, uh, he talks about the sun within the sun. We are suns within the sun. And um, 
Well, I, I agree with you that I think in those places and at the heart of his philosophy, I think he's getting at, yes, exactly the same issue that we're talking about in Husserl of I am transcendental subjectivity. And yet when we try to describe it, it doesn't seem like just me somehow. And how do we even talk about that? To me, this also uh, creates the problem of, of what we will come up with, which is Husserl's analysis of time, because the question is when we're talking about what's behind, what's before, uh, from what did this arise, seem to imply a dynamic process in time. And we're very used to that in the psychophysical world. But if we deny ourselves the, uh, the technique that's available in the physical world and say, no, no, we bracketed that out, which he also says we are to do, the notion of priority, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the foundation for a concept of priority when we really have discarded all our physical models of priority and causality. Because we're certainly using causal language when we talk about this arising from that in the mind. Anybody else who hasn't spoken yet want to say anything before we go back? All right, um, I feel a little bit reluctant to end the discussion. And I think, Gordon, you're right in the last thing you said about um, the notion of priority and the notion of temporality being one of the things that Husserl is going to, even though he, he recognizes he can't do it full justice in the ideas, he has to at least address. And it's in the section for today. And I think it's the key to understanding the kind of belonging or the kind of indistinction that we are that as Sally, you just said, whether it's in Henri or Husserl, that we can't get behind. It, we're just given that as, as the experiential, we experience it, the experiential condition of possibility. Um, anyway, all right, let's turn to 63. I hope that we could um, go to around 76 and then take another break and see if we have time. Um, a lot is in this middle section, though. So in, in section 63, we begin an excursion through the method of phenomenology per se. Of note here is the fact that Husserl says towards the beginning on page 147 that, quote, the multiplicity and kinds of forms of lived experiences, mental processes, is indeed inexhaustible, unerschöpflicher. That is, our lived experiences are not generated beforehand in their totality, but they are lived into by means of the multiplicity opening up by virtue of what we experience as given. Thus, the strange way in which Husserl points to consciousness as a priori, quote, on 147 in the middle, this infinite field of the a priori of consciousness, which in its peculiar ownness, Eigenheit, has never received its due, indeed has never been seen, must be brought under cultivation, erbar zumachen, and made to yield its fullest fruits. There are not a handful of kinds of lived experiences only, memory, expectation, fantasy, perception. There are too many to count. There are value experiences, beauty experiences, judging experiences, judging as true, as false, etc., there is an experience of relation, of indecision, annihilation, generation of the other person, of the divine, whatever. The role of the phenomenologist then is like that of the farmer. The field of consciousness is capable of showing forth many different fruits. We cultivate what appears and assist these experiences in helping us understand what consciousness is, what it means, with what is bound up, with what it is bound up, as those come to fruition. So the beginning is the problem, Husserl says. We can't start with categories as Kant did, 
We can't start with principles or axioms as Euclid did. We cannot discern a method within an ongoing attitude as do the sciences that lie within the natural attitude. Rather, we must begin with a method, and this is page 148, the first full paragraph. We must begin with a method that can, quote, bring without exception the field of affairs pertaining to transcendentally pure consciousness within the regard which seizes upon it. That is, we need a method to bring the field of consciousness as such in its intertwining with objects into view. And how are we to do that since we cannot survey the field all at once, since it is precisely the field of living, lived experiences, temporality, which relies on givenness and which demands time to survey. Such a method, Husserl argues, must have, and here's Olga's point from the beginning, page 148, quote, the most perfect freedom from presuppositions and concerning itself an absolute reflective insight. We can presuppose neither that we give the field to ourselves, nor that we are given the field. We can say neither that we see the whole before the parts, nor that we see the parts before the whole. There is rather a sense of becoming aware that the method will be the method of living into the whole with which we are always already engaged, while still not being able to grasp exhaustively or adequately the whole by means of the part or moment that we live now. It is, as Husserl said earlier, like the way in which memory can swim along with an experience for a while, but not completely. And yet the inadequacy, as long as we practice phenomenology, Husserl maintains, is not a threat to its validity, for we exist as that validity. The method can open the field of transcendental pure consciousness as the field in which there is, Sally's point here, the happening of appearing, of meaning, of being, as the intertwining of self and other, imminent and transcendent. Within that, there is the possibility of always finding new shapes of lived experience and new ways in which consciousness is embedded as the index of that transcendence. I'm going to go to 65. The way in which Husserl can claim that the method opens the whole field of transcendental pure consciousness while not doing so exhaustively, as if he were a Kantian opening of the categories, seems to me to come at the top of page 150. There, Husserl claims that if someone objects to the reflexive method of phenomenology, they do not know what they are talking about. Of course it is true, quote, that the mental processes, lived experiences of this research itself with this attitude and line of vision should, when taken in phenomenological purity, at the same time belong to the realm to be explored. Phenomenology is a method of encountering lived experiences while its reflections, its method and acts of seizing upon, are also lived experiences. The thing that phenomenology is, is of a piece with what it describes. Physics operates by way of a reduction of experience to a certain mathematizable ideal. Phenomenology operates by way of entering into the world of lived experience by means of a lived experience. As he describes it toward the bottom of page 150, phenomenology is, quote, to be entirely a science within the limits of mere immediate intuition, a purely descriptive eidetic science. It is the bringing to light the happening of intentionality, or as he says here, as is on page 150, the events of pure consciousness. Uh, I think it's right at the bottom. Events of pure consciousness, bewusst seins for Kamnisse. It's one of the few times that he talks about events in some approximate way, like Ereignis and Heidegger or something else. Like it's, it, he is talking about events here. And then clarifying them by way of the language uh, of phenomenology being dictated by the things themselves, or as he says, by allowing, quote, their sense to be prescribed purely by what is beheld or generically seen. This is still on page 150. Somewhat like the expression that conceptualizes the things being found to be at least partly dictated by the things themselves, given an intuition, somewhat like that, the method of phenomenology is first performed and then settled into. The field is a priori, as is the method, but the a priori character of both field and method is set within their interaction. 
the procedure, which I, I find it, and maybe I just don't know German well enough, but I find it ironic that the word for procedure is verfahren, and experience is erfahrung. Anyway, I think we could think about that. The procedure, verfahren, he says at the bottom of page 50 and on to top of page 51, quote, serves at first only for the sake of looking about in the new province. You know, imagine some people moving out to the Midwest, to Colorado, to start their farm, and they, you know, kind of digging around, seeing what's going to grow there. That, that's the image that I have. But then phenomenology performs a second order of reflection, which Husserl calls scientific reflection on the essence of the procedure itself, 151 at the top. So the scientific reflection is the self-grounding of the project of phenomenology, once it sees that conceptual clarity is given by means of the modes of givenness encountered. Quote, this is 151, about 10 lines from the top. Here, the essential relatedness of phenomenology to itself becomes manifest in that what reflection on the method examines and ascertains under the headings of clarity, insight, expression, and the like is on its side itself included in the domain of phenomenology. What is essential is the experience, one that we live, that things in their essential intertwining with us can help us to formulate the way in which we express their sense. The things we experience, the essences we see, are given in such a way that our proper phenomenological position is description, is extension of the givenness in the way that they push toward. Whatever we say about method and reflection and what we are doing as phenomenologists then has to obey that principle, or as Husserl says toward the end of section 65, quote, the concepts used actually conform faithfully, Troy and Passen, to what is given. And that, you know, conform faithfully, it really also means adapt, I think. So the concepts used actually adapt faithfully to what is given. We need to settle into our language the way we settle into the field of consciousness. And the things themselves that we are given help us to do that. As we discussed earlier, this entire book has been phenomenology from the start. This is the last sentence of section 65. Quote, this whole essay, which aims at preparing the way for phenomenology, is itself phenomenology throughout. I remember, Felix, you were talking this way about this in our first meeting. Uh, insofar as we take the principle of reflection on experience to be guided by the events of givenness within consciousness as such. I'm going to move on to section 67. Husserl then turns to talking about the nearness or remoteness of the essences that we seize upon in our lived experiences, particularly the essences of lived experiences as such, which the method of phenomenology allows us to access. Essences and particulars, essential lived experiences and particular ones, both allow for us to perceive or live or seize upon them with the possibility of, quote, absolute nearness or clarity, 153. And I know, Olga, you were interested in this remoteness and, and nearness before. Essential intuition, eidetic intuition, is still intuition. And thus the essence can appear as, this is 154 at the top, quote, not merely somehow or other as it itself standing in view and as given, but as purely given something itself, or ein gegebenes selbst, completely and precisely as it is in itself. What does this mean, this sentence, top of 154? It means the phenomenology, I take it, pursues each experience of an essence, the essence of a lived experience, as something that either I can move toward or that can move toward me of its own agency. The approach to each essence is commanded by that essence, solicited by it, supported by it like moving toward the center and the front in order to hear the jazz band performance adequately in the, the hall, as clearly as possible, consciousness is solicited by the essence to get to know it from a certain distance, from a certain vantage point. If I want to perceive the essence of a lived experience, say memory, I must change my standpoint and immerse myself in recollection. If I want to perceive the essence of a lived experience of anticipation, I must change myself into an anticipation. The absolute nearness, of course, is often and perhaps always not discovered 
Our seats in the concert are never the singular best ones, and thus there is almost always unclarity with respect to our experience of the essence. This is 154 at the top. Insofar as a residue of unclarity remains, it casts a shadow, Vershatet, over certain moments in which, uh, certain moments in that which is itself given, and those moments remain outside the circle of light, suffusing the purely given. So there's a shadow, and we could talk about the relationship between Vershatet and Avshatom, the, the um, profiles of the thing. So the point of this section, I take it, is to fuse the directionality of consciousness moving nearer with the self-givenness of the object or essence by talking about clarity and unclarity. But this discussion is itself for something else, namely the way that our adverting to things, coming to turn our attention to them, implies that perception happens even on the fringes, on the peripheries, within the concatenations of references given in this actual actional perception here and now. I perceive this sentence on the screen as I type it, but I also perceive the desk, the icons at the bottom of the screen, hear the music playing on the speaker, etc. The interplay between nearness and remoteness, clarity and unclarity, movement and stillness, allows for me to transition between the paper and the music, between this word and the next. Accordingly, this is a quote at the top of 155, accordingly, for example, Perceptually given can signify merely ready for perception, Farnemungsbereit. Our role in the happening of meaning then is both motion and readiness, an interconnected field of acts that allows perceptions of objects on the margins, within the horizon, etc., to engage our readiness and thus to move ourselves nearer to experience, to the essence, to the particular that engages us before we are aware of it doing so. Before I emphasize the word belonging, now I'm emphasizing the word readiness. And as I said with Eckhart, the readiness is the moment of birth. They are the same moment. I'm gonna to move to section 69. In this section, Husserl perhaps somewhat surprisingly rehabilitates the power of the essences themselves to move toward us. And again, I have Bill's and Gordon's and other people's questions about essences in mind. And I really think it's, um, what do we get? The essences show us that they are and what they are. Um, so um, atta attaining nearness and clarity is not really just our own doing. Rather, even in obscurity, as he says on page 157, the essence itself can bring itself nearer. This is the first full paragraph on page 157, quote, what is obscurely intended to comes closer to us in its own manner. Finally, it knocks on the door of intuition. So I'm going to tell you a story that's probably ridiculous and wrong. You can tell me that later, but for the moment, I'm going to believe that it's right and kind of cool. Um, so I was four years old, and my parents were involved in an ecumenical interreligious program called Marriage Encounter. They had meetings of adults who were married in our house every month or so, and I was four, remember. So one day, my grandmother and I were in a car together, and I looked at her and said in wonderment, we're in a meeting, aren't we, Grandma? That which was obscurely intended as a happening of adults where children were sent to bed knocked at the door of intuition. Of course, I still had not had the clear and absolute nearness of the essence meeting, but the particulars were passing away in favor of the essence slowly. I needed to respond to the moment of wonder and getting it with more work of my own. I needed to respond to move to open the door. I needed, as Husserl says here, this is on page 170, uh, 157, to go towards the, quote, halo of undetermined determinability the Hof, and separate my experience of different meetings into, quote, a number of intendings. But eventually, the mutual movement of the essence and myself brought the experience of a meeting as such into sharper view. It was as if, in the car with my grandmother, I perceived the essence meeting completely, quote, completely, but not as yet the differentia. So I'm going to go to 70 because I'm continuing the, the theme of the meeting, right? since we're in one now, I suppose. Um, 
Situated as I am within a double agency, mine and the objects, the happening of meaning, the event of consciousness, may tend to obscure my own role. If I am limited to responding to an object's call, say of a house in its profiles, or a concert in its perfect seat with respect to distance and direction of sound, where is my agency in the perception of essences? In section 70, Husserl talks about how fantasy, and Olga, this is where the truest freedom comes in. Fantasy is itself one of my most free acts, and one that is incredibly necessary for my ability to seize upon essences in full clarity and pure givenness. In the act of fantasy, I remain tied to intuition and to perception, which, unlike an experience of anger or joy, is not dissipated when I shift to a reflection on that experience. Rather, fantasy shares perception's longevity, but evades perception's clear and total tie to the given that is involved. In fantasy, I can vary and reshape the perceptual experiences in order to allow different manners or modes of givennesses to layer over the top of one another and to promote the movement of the essence towards me. I can remember the meetings at my house of the adults, remember my grandmother in the car, place in fantasy several adults in the back seat, vary the kinds of things we talk or laugh or cry about, vary the strictness or the looseness or the order of the agenda, vary the number of friends or acquaintances, and then the essence moves toward me seemingly of its own accord. The power of fantasy is my contribution to the event of essential intuition. And this is on page 160. It's the last sentence of page of, of section 70. He says, feigning Fiction is the source from which the cognition of eternal truths is fed. So there, go, there is going, there has to be, I haven't thought through this completely, but there has to be a connection between the power of freedom in fantasy and the power of freedom in reflection. They must require one another, they must build on one another, and the essences, the what they are, is not as important as the that they appear. And as they appear, I, my belonging to the world shifts. I now see things I did not see. I hear things I did not hear, right? Section 72. Although I did not ask us to study this section in detail, I would like to turn to 72 briefly in order to show Husserl's comparison of phenomenology to geometry because of fantasy. For in geometry, too, fantasy and variation comes out as essential to its method. However, geometry is dealing with the generic essence of space, as Husserl says in the middle of 163. And as such, and this is again in 163 in the middle, geometry can com be completely certain of dominating, beherrschen, actually by its method, all the possibilities and of determining them exactly. I'm going to focus on dominating. This domination of space by geometry arises in its generic pursuit of a generic space. The lived geometry of lived space, that would look quite different, more like an Escher print. Such a lived geometry would be perhaps like architecture or sculpture that renews itself continuously through compossible forms and variants that arise from within one's life in tension and in tandem with one another. The way geometry, again in Husserl's words, unambiguously determines to totality, this is the le next to last paragraph in italics, all of the possible forms in its field means, Husserl says, that in geometry, quote, nothing in the province is left open. There can be no Escher here. And secondly, I mean, that's clearly false. There could be geometries that allow Escher, but I'm making a point there. But phenomenology is not like this at all. First, it does not dominate the thing. In fact, it is at risk of being overwhelmed by the thing itself in the mutuality of the event of meaning. It recovers us, or we recover ourselves, only through a kind of fantasy that still allows the essence to show forth on its own terms. And when we find the words to talk about this or, this or that lived experience essentially, or to describe lived experiences themselves as such, those words also are tied to the givenness we have already agreed to serve or to play with. I really like the idea of playing, because if you've ever seen kids play, 
there's a whole lot of uh, political things that go on in children's and it very often flows back and forth between who's in charge and who's not in charge. And so the, there's, a, there's a circle as it were. Secondly, phenomenology is centrally concerned to leave open, leaving open a province of lived experience as it is experience itself that embraces both subjects and objects, not we. It is experience in which we come to see the poles of self and an object. We are the stewards of that which we claim to be our own, but which in effect also claims us. The sphere of lived experience is given as a whole field. And so in that sense is a totality or a whole, but it is ambiguously or emptily determined insofar as the concatenation of all our acts and all of the sides or essences of meaning cannot be but sketched out. Much remains undetermined, and this is the intersection of phenomenology with desire. What more can we see if we pursue phenomenology? We only know as it happens to us, but we are certain that more will come. And I think that's the necessity and the freedom coming together. They come together in desire. Um, I'm going to skip to 75, and then 75 and 76, we'll pause again for um, some discussion, and then we'll see if we have time for more. This is section 75. What it means then for phenomenology to remain within lived experience is that it gives up the natural scientific project of exact determination and of useful prediction based on analogy. Both determination and prediction rest on reducing what is experienced to principles, fairly static principles. However, Husserl says at the top of page 168, any consciousness, any lived experience demands that we recognize, quote, that it fluctuates in flowing away Gordon, your point on time, in various dimensions in such a manner that there can be no speaking of a conceptually exact fixing of any eidetic concreta or any of their immediately constitutive moments. A lived experience is temporal and as such flows. Any moment within that lived experience is also shifting or making a transition. Not only that, a lived experience of one essential type cannot on its own ground progress by analogy with another. Husserl very clearly re rejects analogy as a method by which phenomenology operates. This is on 169 at the bottom. Nothing of value for the establishing of phenomenology can be gained by proceeding according to analogy. Of course, this is somewhat ironic because later in Cartesian Meditations, Husserl will slightly revise this statement, allowing as he does something that looks like analogy and the perception of the other person. But even here he notes it is analogical without being an actual analogy. I experience the other as other, not because of a second me over there forming an analogy with my own self-experience, but as an otherness that is already imminent and as imminent already radically situates and differentiates itself from me. It is both the establishment of an analogy and the immediate and simultaneous erasing of that, of that analogy insofar as the other is already within. Perhaps it is analogy here and in Cartesian meditations in a similar way that Derrida talks about difference. Uh, 76. Having laid out the method in the previous chapter, we might say that now we make a beginning in terms of delimiting the field of transcendental consciousness as such. And that beginning is a familiar one. It is the sense of the distinction between consciousness and transcendence. The beginning is, quote, the primal category of consciousness as transcendental. From that, every other category of being grows. And our attempt to trace the family tree of being in phenomenology gives us the task of paying attention to how the object is within the subject. This is page 171, the first full paragraph. The theory of categories must start entirely from this most radical of all ontological distinctions, being as consciousness and being as something which becomes manifested, bekundendas, in consciousness, transcendent being. Again, I think what he means here is that the ontological distinction arises within consciousness as not as in me, but as me in it. So the, the distinction arises, that's the beginning, but the beginning points backward. 
um, to, to the origin of the distinction as arising from within. The reduction, within what? That's the question we can't answer. And that's the thing that I think people have trouble with. Within what? What is this thing that we're in that we then arrive at the recognition of the distinction? That's that's the, the, the rub, as it were. The reduction, Husserl says, gives us, page 171 still, a revaluing change in sign. The sign of the object, as if simply cut off from the subject. The sign that simply points outward now also points inward. It's the change of the sign. The object is shown to relate to the subject in its pointing outward. And so the object is provided with an index, 171 at the bottom, last part of the first full paragraph. The future sides of the house I walk around are connected with me insofar as their meaning is an index of my future acts that unveil them. What it means for the object to transcend me then is for it to participate in the continuity of my past, present, and future by being intimately linked to the thematic concatenation of my acts. So I'll stop for a little bit and, and see uh, what comments you might have. I mean, I can also go forward, uh, but I want you to have a chance to say whatever you'd like. I really like that story about four years old. It reminded me the first time my daughter went on trick or treat, she was two years old. And when we were finishing, she said, she kept saying, trick or treat is over, trick or treat. And I think she'd never, that's the first time being able to look back at something that happened and reflect and now it's over. And you talk about this moving toward of the object toward us and of us toward the object. I think that example makes it very clear and the one thing I wanted to say about it is, we're using words like moving toward, domination. Those aren't matters of causality. It's a matter of, he uses the word geltung, or, uh, and uh, I think that's relevant to the question Gordon had. What it even means for something to become evident at all, and how that happens. Um. So to that, um, every time when we get clarity uh, on something, uh, we are apprehending the essence of that something. But the essence is yet not verbalized. So um, uh, is it a process of uh, clarification? Uh, which needs to end up in verbalization necessarily uh, for the essence to be grasped. Um, uh, and then, of course, what's the intersubjective contribution to this? Um, there was a second, I mean, to question I wanted to bring in, but uh, maybe stop here for now. Well, I, I think that's so important, the point that Olga just raised. I mean, if we just stop and let this meeting be a subject of our phenomenological attention, we understand how dependent we are on interpersonal assent as we struggle. People nod or they don't nod, or somebody says, well, uh, what Peter said there was helpful, or I don't understand yet what Peter meant. And it's as if we're constructing our internal affairs according to this very complex 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 person interaction. And our skill at expression uh, is the hallmark and the criterion of what the case will turn out to be. So if, if Peter were to write, well, clearly Peter's writing something. And what, what, what Peter is writing will have a certain form, which will be an incomprehensibly 
complex mesh of what he already was able to say with what he's and what he has learned to be able to say as a result of this and so many other interactions he's going to have. So, and all of this gets reposed in language and then it's frozen for the time being in a book or a paper or a recording or whatever it is. And what the relationship is of that to my consciousness and the consciousness as of each of you is way above my pay grade to try to to try to figure out. But it it, it seems to me that that's just hugely important. Uh, because we kind of take it for granted as we wrestle here for two hours once a month. And what we are doing is exactly the thing itself. Okay. Second question or comment. Um, Husserl uses the term uh, substrate. And it seems to me, and I may be wrong, that... Uh, he uses it at least in two kinds of sense. One is um, foundation uh, in the sense of uh, logical foundation um, as an alternative or concept which phenomenologically grasps what in ordinary thinking we would call causality. Maybe I'm not sure, but the second uh, second um, sense, and again I'm not sure, seems to be related to the uh, material foundation, and I want to be very careful with it because we just got rid of it effectively by reducing out you know reference to reality and reference to natural science. Uh, but yet it seems to be lingering in the background of thinking of any kind of thinking, and thus a part of um, phenomenal field. Uh, so if you have any insights <laughs> to share on the substrate, because later on, um, somewhere um, uh, not in the ideas, but in uh, later texts, Husserl laments that um, uh, that he cannot identify what is the substrate of transcendental consciousness. And I wonder if that should be understood materialistically or naturalistically uh, somehow. Well, I just want to, no, man, yeah. I'd like to um, reflect on something that Peter has been um, describing. So uh, on the one hand, um, we have this um, conversation, if you like, um, in, in our um, perception, I want to go beyond perception, whatever it is, that interaction between consciousness and the world, which is, um, he, and, and I'm glad he used the word dominate, that there's somehow or other um, this um, consciousness, this active, intentional act, is not a domination. And, and this this is interesting to me because um, we have this almost mythology that um, Marion and Levinas have um, fed off of, <laughs> which is this notion that there's almost this sort of static understanding of Noema and um, and noetic activity, which um, makes and everything things that, um, and in fact, uh, Levinas even talks about it as violence. Um, and so, but here, um, Husserl is, at least the way Peter is talking about it now, is giving us this sense that um, that's, it, it almost feels like all experience is in Marion's sense saturated. Um, but yet, um, Husserl also has this tension in this, this understanding in that he still believes in some sort of eidos, 
in some sort of essence, which I take to be static in some sense. So there seems to be this tension between this eidos, which is eternal, um, static, and this experience, which is, um, to use Marion's word, saturated. One thing that strikes me, and I, I think it's tangentially related to what Bill has just said, is the no is the use of the word toy or faithful. I mean, it comes up here a couple of times, especially in, in 65 and 66. This, and like toy in German has a sense of, you know, a, a toy a find, right? A, 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 a loyal, faithful friend, you know, and, it, and it's that sense that that phenomenology somehow has to be faithful, which of course, also has the possibility of betrayal, right? Which is within it. And so there's that struggle to be faithful to something. Um, and I guess the question then is, what are we being faithful to? Um, and, 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 and I mean, in my own sense, maybe it is a question of a saturated phenomenon. You know, it's, it, it's being faithful to that which is appearing in its appearance, in its givenness. Um, um, I, I mean, I don't know where that gets us, but it, it, but it seems to me that that's kind of um, Husserl's claim, at least, that this is where, um, that, uh, that, that this is the, the challenge of phenomenology, this kind of fidelity. I like a lot of what everyone has said, and I, I'm particularly interested in substrate and fidelity. Um, I don't know what to do with them yet, but I, I'm thinking about them. What would you like to do? I can, I think within 15 minutes, I could read through what I understood 77, 78, and 79 to be about. And that would get us to Gordon's comment about 79. Um, and that would mean that, you know, 80 to 86 would be left for next time, as well as chapters three and four, which would get us all the way through till the last big division on reason. Would that seem like something you'd want to do? Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll try and be quick, uh, but I, I really enjoyed as I think Gordon, you did 77 through 79. And so I have some things to say. Um, I'm humbled by all the things that you all are picking out and I feel good about what we're doing together because I feel like we're all doing the work together. I really do. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you're all here. So 77, our beginning is now situated. Our capacity to notice the distinction between consciousness and transcendence is situated by means of bringing forward and describing our wonderful capacity for reflection. Noticing the quote, radical ontological distinction between consciousness and transcendence as happening within the reduced notion of consciousness as such is possible because we can reflect on our lived experiences while remaining within them in some remarkable way. Reflection allows for all lived experiences, which cash out the radical ontological distinction, to appear in their own right. They are, Husserl implies, made for reflection as an internal possibility of their own. A lived experience is not a hermetically sealed affair. Rather, it is and remains, even as it passes from anticipation into lived presence or from lived presence into memory, thoroughly open to the act of reflection arising within and without it. There are always, this is 174 at the bottom, quote, possible ego regards directed to the components of the mental process and to its intentionalities. That is, because of our freedom that is generated in living the lived experience, and because of the fact that our I, ich, is as free, multi-layered and multiply placed, 
Reflection can come to dwell in each lived experience as if simultaneously from within and from without. On the one hand, reflection grasps the lived experience from without. It seizes upon it as if an object. On the other hand, reflection joins the act of living the lived experience from within, as it is able to distinguish between act and object and to divide its rays of regard and, and move back and forth in a zigzag from one to the other. This operating from within and from without at the same time is an echo of the radical ontological distinction between consciousness and transcendence. In each lived experience, there is a simultaneous bifurcation of direction, imminent and transcendent, that is unified in the act of living the experience. So too in reflection, which can turn the lived experience itself into an object while remaining intimately within it. This simultaneous placement of being within the lived experience and without it allows the reflection to be not another kind of thing than the lived experience, but to be a lived experience itself that can generate further reflections even upon itself. Quote, this is 174 at the bottom, the reflections are mental processes, lived experiences, and as reflections can become, this is, this is your word, Olga, the substrates of new reflections. Our reflection, even within the natural attitude, seems to bring with it this internal identity as a lived experience which arises within the original lived experience. Even before or outside of phenomenology, and this is 175, second full paragraph, quote, we are convinced, überzeugt, that reflection on the basis of and in recollection gives us cognizance of our earlier lived experiences. Not only that, Husserl says, we are likewise certain that we can reflect in anticipation too. Listening to a piece of music, I can reflect how I anticipate what is coming in the melody, even if I have not heard the song before. Within the reduction, I reflect on the way I am enjoying the process of understanding Husserl's thoughts in this section. The example is on page 176. Within that experience of enjoying his thinking, I reflect on the enjoying itself. The fact of the reflection's dual placement within and without entails a kind of loss. Quote, the freedom of the course of thought suffers, lied it. I cannot go on in the same way in my processing of the course of Husserl's thought, nor in the enjoyment of it, both of which are intimately combined together in the initial lived experience. Instead, I notice in reflecting on the act of enjoying the thinking and of enjoying the section itself, that I can now be, quote, tracing the past duration and the mode of givenness of what is pleasing, of paying attention to earlier phases in the course of the theoretical course of thought, and also to the regard which was previously directed to it. This is 176 in the middle. The, the point is going to be about joy and how joy in particular is, is difficult to reflect upon and to preserve at the same time. The reflection can look at the thing itself within the lived experience, the, quote, mode of givenness of what is pleasing, as well as the regard that was directed to it. It sees the whole and the relationship between the parts. The new regard that the act of reflecting allows is the regard to the way in which consciousness and object respond to one another and are intimately united. But this means, as Husserl says, that what reflection contributes is the act of, quote, this is 176, making even more effectively clear the difference between a rejoicing which is lived, but not regarded, and a regarded rejoicing. Perhaps I was not aware that I was enjoying reading Husserl so much. As I was trying to type up these comments, I was so intent on making what Husserl was saying clear to everyone and to myself that I was disconnected from my own enjoyment and my own desire. Reflecting on the act of reading and typing, though, I now see that that lived experience was one of enjoyment and that I missed out on living the joy explicitly and directly. Reflection, then, is an important job. It is not an extra that is nice to have. It is essentially the way in which we can make explicit all that is unregarded in our lived experiences, which carry forth meaning that can be discovered later in reckoning again and again, with the relationship of whole to parts of this most intimate unity of consciousness and transcendence. It is because of the ambiguous place of reflection within and without that I can do so. Reflection is the catalyst to following out the way the experience positions me within it so as to be continuously fruitful. And perhaps in Felix's really important sense, not only continuously fruitful, but continuously faithful. Um, 
There's always more to see and to know, but I must follow it out reflectively in a systematic and structural way, always hearkening back to the difficult productive unity of consciousness and transcendence. In section 78, we encounter, we continue performing a phenomenology of reflection uh, that he takes pains to talk about in terms of how reflection manifests itself in three ways. This is 177 at the bottom. First, reflection is the name for acts that reveal the stream of lived experiences. Second, reflection is the method of consciousness for the knowledge, or kentness, of consciousness in general. Third, reflection is an object of possible studies. Reflection, in other words, can be seen in its interrelationships with each of the acts that participate in its essence, or which, as particular lived experiences, quote, belong essentially together. So reflection notices belonging. Act, method, object. Reflection is able to reveal lived experience as a whole stream in its internal concatenations because reflection in its triune order bears a structural similarity to all of consciousness in its parts, act and object, and in its whole method. Reflection is able to lead the one who reflects toward a sense of her or his or their lived experience of consciousness as such. And finally, reflection can bring to light its own essence, its belonging to the other acts that extend givenness within the phenomenological field. Whether act, method, or object, it becomes clear that reflection is a modification of consciousness. He says this on 178 at the top. This modification is a change in attitude and a certain transmutation, um Wandlung, of the lived experience on which it reflects. This is because reflection is that which is both within and without. It is perhaps a kind of symbiotic life. That's really kind of a question to everybody. Is it a symbiotic life that grows up from within and as such changes the orig original unmodified lived experience into one that is now regarded in explicit ways with all the concomitant meanings that such explicit attention brings. Husserl says we must begin to uncover, page 179 at the top, systematically all the modifications that reflection performs. Such modifications are what he calls operations in inverted commas. This is perhaps unfortunate since it sounds very machine-like or mechanized, but reflection is anything but an impersonal machine. It is rather, I take it, that Husserl is trying to find an expression for what makes reflection both similar and different from the internal modifications of lived experiences as a flux of becoming and from the modifications of memory or recollection or fantasy. Lived experience then is essentially a coherent, continuous transition of transmutation or modification by means of, quote, operations. Allowing reflections to show the specific differences between experiences or between reflections and the experiences upon which they reflect, this proves difficult and yet important as the very attempt to allow reflection to do its work leads us back, quote, to certain primal mental processes, er erlebnisse, to impressions which absolutely originary mental processes lived experiences exhibit. Reflections point toward the original, the impression, the er erlebnis, to the primacy of direct intuition, with or without regard for what they are doing. Reflection is a new kind of universal modification, page 180 in the middle. As such, reflections are experiencing erfahrende acts by which we, quote, know something of the stream of lived experiences and of the necessary relatedness of the stream to the pure ego, page 180, last full paragraph. Reflection thus allows us to see within the lived experience, in its very interrelatedness, to other experiences within a whole stream, so it allows us to see the interrelations, and to see how the stream relates to the reine ich, pure I. Reflection thus gives us a sense of our wholeness and of the way that wholeness is, because it is a whole, or as it is a whole, how it relates necessarily to the I. But there is more. Reflection does not apprehend the internal related, does not just apprehend the internal relatedness of each lived experience to the stream, thus to the I. Reflection also sees that each and every lived experience belongs to the ego, quote, this is page 180, last full paragraph, 
precisely insofar as it regards or can direct its regard through the stream to something other than the ego. Auf anderes ich fremdes, something alien to the ego. It is reflection then that can see how what is mine and lived experience is mine only insofar as it is directed, intertwined with the sense of the alien, fremdes. Only reflection and phenomenology can give us that. Our identity is given by means of both bring, being broken open to the sense of alien transcendence and to the uneasy yet intimate continuous unity with that to which we are only ever broken open is something we are broken open toward. So open and toward. Reflection is the revelation of the continuous uneasy unity of I and alien. Because reflection is so intimately bound up with each lived experience from within, or if you will, from a position that is neither simply inside nor outside, it gives us to see significance about lived experiences with, quote, absolute legitimacy, 180 at the bottom. There is no possibility of skepticism about reflection's indwelling character. It is rather that which allows us to see the very difference between absolute and relative legitimacy. It is reflection that allows us to see how retention, retaining in terms of time consciousness, allows for the holding on to what has just been perceived with absolute legitimacy, even in a non-self-aware way. Retention is what reflection sees as always already occurring without our choice, as the condition for having a continuous experience. Reflection also notes, though, that recollection or explicit memory has only, quote, relative legitimacy, insofar as what recollection or memory tries to do is to be within the whole prior lived experience and the parts at the same time. But memory, recollection, cannot do that in a guaranteed way, insofar as it depends on our choice, our freedom, and our limitations. I may be unable to remember all of the experience, be unwilling, consciously or not, to remember part of it, insofar as my ego is explicitly within recollection, and insofar as it tries to witness in the now what has already passed, it, my ego, confronts its I cannot. Reflection thus dwells within the whole of the lived experience in its own essential way, and in doing so can come to see other modifications or operations, like memory, other modes of my consciousness being with itself, in their essential structure and in their essential difference from reflection. In section 79, um, so it's probably two and a half pages of single space, so maybe five, 10 minutes, is that okay? Yeah. In this section, Husserl notes the difference between psychology as concerned with, quote, existential findings and phenomenology as concerned with essential findings. It's so going back to Bill's point about Sartre. I think it might be helpful in this section. It is important that we briefly touch upon this attempt to make this distinction because I have been deliberately blurring the line between existential and essential. I have been asking and trying to come up with examples of how we live the essential structures of consciousness. But I think that it's permissible even for Husserl because his point here, I take it, is to stay within the province of consciousness as the overarching event of being with transcendence. It is not that my own psychology remains outside of phenomenology per se. It is that my own tendencies or neuroses or whatever are given a new sign by virtue of being derived from an essential structure or system. It is because I am phenomenological that I can come to see how I am always able, perhaps even liable, to fall into the object, a mother, a father, an enemy, a friend, a lover, as if they were my whole world. In other words, it's because we understand the relationship to objects and to other people that we can understand psychology. Um, in addition, Husserl does say that between both methods, existential and essential, phenomenological and psychological, on page 182 in the middle, he says, between both methods, there subsist inner relationships, indeed, in an appreciable measure, congruences. So if we give up the attempt by Husserl's contemporaries to talk about the person's psyche as if it were separate from the world, as if it were a self-subsisting and rather detached thing that could get ill or well, 
then we see that phenomenology takes as given the realm of pure consciousness as such in its essential shapes that are lived as such. It is the living of the essences that are important and that will get us to something particular, psychological. The geometer does not care if triangles exist in the world, and that's good, for they don't. And it would not disprove anything about idealized mathematically constructed space, even if they did. The proof that reflection exists in that or this person is not something the phenomenologist cares about either, cannot be proven outside of the lived experiences of reflection and our sharing them with one another, which I take, Gordon, you were to be doing when you talked about uh, writing and, and listening and, and thinking. For the acts of reflection must be lived. However, once I can discover reflection within myself and marvel at the way it occurs so as to give me access to the very manner in which my ego is mine through its relationship to what is alien to it, this is, of course, something that will matter to my existence. It will reshape how I perceive the meaning that is at stake in my relationship with the divine, with my family, friends, colleagues, etc. But this is something I do to extend phenomenology into the particular existence that is my life. And that extension is not something that transcendental phenomenology needs for it to be true. We live on different layers simultaneously, existential and essential, pure and empirical. Phenomenology interrogates the pure, at least in this book of the ideas, but it is not limited to that. In interrogating the pure and in making essential statements about consciousness in general, phenomenology also leans toward the direct intuition that we might call perception, the experience without reflection, the immediate. But this means, I think, that the essential orientation of phenomenology brings it close to the existential and that it grounds the existential insights. Reflection reaches toward the unreflected from within the unreflected. It gives the unreflected to consciousness in its peripheral view. As Husserl says on page 184, reflection, quote, makes eidetic findings about reflectionally unmodified lived experiences as the essentially necessary condition of its possibility. In other words, it works because it works. <laughs> Um, reflection thus has its own way of perceiving or intuiting essences of lived experiences. It sees the unreflected as it grows within the lived experience after that lived experience has already begun. So I don't know if you all like Dolly Parton, but I'm going to tell you about listening to Dolly Parton. So I'm listening to a piece by Dolly Parton, Mule Skinner Blues. I'm not actually listening to it now. I was listening to it before. As I listen, I reflect on how I'm hearing the song. I realize that I have been listening before reflecting, that the song has echoes of her voice, a bullwhip cracking, a certain style of violin or fiddle playing, all of which have called me to start listening reflectively even before I thought to use my current listening experience as an example. But I came in the middle of hearing the song while I am writing to reflect on the experience of listening to it and thus on the experience of the song itself. And thus, reflection in the phenomenologically reduced sense does not prove that experiences pre-existed. Rather, reflection lives into the previously unreflected as the field of its work. It can neither doubt nor prove the unreflected through reflection. But it can point out the way that we rely on the previous experience of, quote, lived experiences, pure and simple, Schlechten, page 184. Reflection in its internal commitments to a lived experience into which it grows by means of a free action of my own. By means of these internal commitments, reflection extends givenness. It extends the givenness of the active experience that was unreflected by noticing the very movement of its unity. This is page 187, the first full paragraph. Quote, the perceiving becomes given. Zur Gebenheit kommt as the perceiving of just this perceived, the present consciousness becomes given as consciousness of something intended to. It would make no sense to doubt whether reflection has a handle on what it reflects on, because it isn't anywhere else, but both within and without at the same time. My choice to reflect interacts with the lived experience from within. There is a transmutation and suddenly the moments of the lived experience, essentially one's act and one's object in their interrelationships, show themselves. If this structure matters to me in a particular way, 
say that Dolly Parton has become a hero of mine for her support of LGBTQ folks and her funding of a vaccine for COVID, just for example. That mattering happens because the way the song and I reach into one another radiates inward and outward. I live the relationship within reflection in ways I did not even understand prior to the act of reflection. And hence does Plato have Socrates repeatedly say that the poets understand their poems the least, for they are at first and perhaps always unreflective in their work, dwelling within the very intimacy, the predistinction of their unity with the work. Reflection, then, is the process whereby we come to see the essential structures of consciousness that we live. And it is only as seeing these structures that we can commit ourselves to an effective description of our lives. Forgoing the trap of either dominating or submitting, this reminds me of the Levinas thing, to the alterity that is at the heart of our unity of this pure I, this ego whom I am. And what may be a stark reminder of the religious sense of all this and I, I, this is the first time that I'm really working through this with an eye to the religious. I think it's shot through with religion from the very beginning, and I'm only starting to get that now. But Hutzerl says anyway on page 187 that, quote, even God can only acquire cognition, erkentness, Gordon, it was one of your words from the very beginning, of his consciousness and consciousness content by reflection. Even God only knows by reflection. Page 187, the end of the first paragraph. The divine then as infinite projects itself into finitude in order to gain the power to extend its givenness. My, I, I think that's mine, the extension of givenness. I don't know, but I really think it makes sense. that givenness gets extended by means of reflection. Um, the divine projects itself into finitude in order to gain the power to extend its givenness into its coming home to its own life. Again, it would seem that an investment in a people, the people of Israel or the people of Muhammad or in a people of a generation such as the sun, in such an investment is precisely the way in which the divine comes home to its own structures as divine. There is then something absolutely true about reflection. It gives the pre-reflected as the very motor of the reflected and thus draws hermeneutics out of the previously meaningful, if implicit, retention and protension that draws the consciousness that enacts these towards the object and towards itself. So that gets us through 79, at least my own view of 79. Um, does anyone have anything they would like to say before we um, go? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, go ahead, Gordon. No, I'm just going to say thank you very much. Well, I'm basically going to say the same thing. <laughs> what I what I what I've been doing and found most fruitful is um, to um, listen to the recordings again, <laughs> and then to take notes, and then I can reflect upon them. Um, and that's where I really um, pick up most of what you're saying because I have trouble gleaning from um, our in our in-person context, everything that you have to say, because I think what you're saying is often um, much more profound than I can um, gather in our um, immediate um, listening. I am presuming that you are writing a book. <laughs> are you writing a book <laughs> about um, this, this text? I mean, I, I would like to, I, I'm not near, I do phenomenology in dribs and drabs in between cleaning bathrooms and taking care of children and teaching like five courses a semester. So it's, oh. it's never it's never clear that what's going to happen. So you know, I I am I'm humbled in front of all of you, um, but I, so I don't know. But I really am excited by reading this book together, which honestly I haven't to my to my shame I have not studied in depth until now, and so I I really. I enjoy, I'm so grateful that you would go back and look at it. And I'm grateful for all the comments. You know, as you as you all reflect, I would really value any challenges or questions in addition to the ones you share here. I would like to put a book together. I am excited about the ideas. I don't think it's gotten a whole lot of 
uh, good treatment. There's one recent book that you know has a bunch of people looking at it. Andrea Staiti, um, you know, published that. But the, you know, and and Recur has this really weird book on it that doesn't really. It's not really readable. And it's it's, it's not a lot. Um, but I hope I hope to do that. But I'm also very cognizant of my own limitations. So please feel free to tell me in in email and chat next time, whatever. Any suggestions you have, any criticisms you have, um, but yeah, I I really do enjoy this book. I think it's it's truly wonderful. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I hope you really have. For those of you who are in the United States, I have have a really happy Thanksgiving, and I will. Um, for those of you who aren't in the United States, I hope you have a really great meal next Thursday. <laughs> uh, and then we'll, we'll get together after that. I'll just let's just read the whole chapters three and four up until the reason divide and i'll send you like some things to focus on and we'll we'll do it again Take thank care. you so much peter it just is so helpful well i i really appreciate all of you very much grateful for you thanks peter happy Bye. thanksgiving everybody yeah, happy thanks. thanksgiving thanks everyone how'd that go was it okay yeah. You're muted. I think that the value we um we are recording Peter. I think we should stop, click the button. Okay. I think that